Welcome to Musculoskeletal Imaging video lecture. Our topic for today would be chapter 16, that's radiologic evaluation of the elbow. So here's a chapter outline. We'll be reviewing the anatomy of the elbow. Um, we'll be introducing you to routine radiologic evaluations as well as uh, certain traumas at the elbow and abnormal conditions at the elbow joint. So just a brief introduction, as we all know, the elbow is the anatomic junction between the arm and the forearm, whereas the shoulder functions to place the upper extremity anywhere within the wide range or wide sphere of its range of motion. The elbow functions to adjust extremities height and length and the functional position of the hand to accomplish prehensile tasks efficiently. The elbow's three separate synovial articulations housed within one joint capsule present unique challenges to clin clinicians involved in treating trauma and dysfunction of this joint. So for the review of anatomy, we go first with osseous anatomy of the elbow joint. So the bones of the elbow are the distal humerus, the proximal ulna, and the proximal radius. The articulation between the humerus and the ulna is known as the humeroulnar joint. The articulation between the humerus and the radius is known as the humeroradial joint. And the articulation between the proximal portions of the ulna and the radius is known as the radio or the proximal radio ulnar joint. And these three separate articulations are within a common joint capsule together make up the elbow joint. The humeral shaft expands at its distal end into the medial here and the lateral condyle or the epicondyles. And the articular portions of these condyles are the trochlea and the capitulum. The spool-shaped trochlea is divided by a semicircular groove or the trochlear sulcus found here. And the trochlea is on the medial aspect of the distal humerus and articulates with the ulna. The rounded capitulum, on the other hand, is on the lateral aspect and articulates with the radius. And the medial and lateral epicondyles are projections located proximally to the trochlea and the capitulum respectively. The distal humerus is marked by three depressions or fossae. Anteriorly, this is the anterior part. Anteriorly is the coronoid fossa, and the radial fossa receives the ulnar coronoid process and the radial head at full elbow flexion, so here and here. While posteriorly, the olecranon fossa here, located in this part, receives the ulnar olecranon process at elbow extension. The proximal ulna has two beak-like processes, the large olecranon process at its tip and the coronoid process on its anterior surface. Between these two processes lies the articular concave trochlear notch, which receives the trochlea. The shallow radial notch on the lateral side of the ulna articulates with the radial head. The proximal radius is distinguished by a head, a neck, and a tuberosity. The radial head is a disc-like and cupped on its upper end, articulating with the capitulum above the ulna medially. The neck is the constricted area below the head, and the tuberosity is an oval prominence distal to the neck. Right, so looking at this diagram, it's the ligamentous anatomy. So approximately half of the elbow stability is provided by the bony configuration of the joint, and the remainder of its stability results primarily from the joint capsule and its medial and lateral ligamentous reinforcements found in this figure. So we start with the ulnar collateral ligament or the medial collateral ligament. It attaches to the medial humeral epicondyle and extends in a broad triangular expansion to the olecranon. And the radial collateral ligament or also known as lateral collateral ligament attaches to the lateral humeral epicondyle and extends to the annular ligament and radial notch of the ulna. The annular ligament of the radius is an oval band enclosing the head of the radius and attaching to the anterior and posterior margins of the radial notch of the ulna. The radial head is able to rotate within the ligamentous sling, which provides its articular stability to the ulna. The main muscles acting on the elbow joint are the tri triceps, biceps, and brachialis, and they also are potential important factors in joint stability. With regards to joint mobility, the humeral ulnar and humeroradial joints of the elbow function as a hinge joints. 
permitting extension and flexion through a range from 0 to 135 degrees or greater. And the proximal radio ulnar joint is a trochoid joint, allowing approximately 90 degrees each of the forearm pernation and supination. Of growth and development, ossification of the elbow begins in the shaft of the humerus, ulna, and radius in the eighth week of fetal life. That's eight. At birth, only these structures are ossified and visible on radiograph, and the elbow joint is entirely cartilaginous at birth. The remaining architecture of the elbow is formed by seven secondary ossification centers. Four secondary ossification centers belong to the humerus, and the uh, three secondary ossification centers belong to the forearm. Now you may ask, Doc, what is the purpose of knowing this? So this is very important in pediatric patients grow or growing children where physiologic structures meaning normal are still growing. So if you don't know the age of the patient, you might mistake them as pathologic structures or tumors such as this and in a five-year-old. So that should be normal. All right, so we're done with anatomy and let's continue with routine radiologic evaluations. So uh, there's what we call as practice guidelines for radiography of the elbow in children and adults. And these practice guidelines assist practitioners in providing appropriate radiologic care for patients. And these practice guidelines exist as an educational tool to direct a reasonable course of action. The goal of radiographic examination at the elbow is to identify or exclude any anatomic abnormalities or disease processes. These are the indications for the radiographic examination. So I think all of these are actually um, common sense. So if you see that there's something wrong with the elbow, then you do a radio radiologic examination. So we move on to the basic projections, uh, radiologic observations, and MRI anatomy. So the minimum recommended projection for the elbow are the anterior-posterior view and the lateral views alone. Sometimes oblique views of the elbow are sometimes included in a, faci fa a faci facilities protocol. Oblique views of the elbow are sometimes included in a facilities protocol or are requested depending on the clinical indications. Um, ACR or the American College of Radiology recommends magnetic resonance imaging or MRI evaluation for chronic elbow pain if radiographs are non-diagnostic or if you don't arrive in any type of diagnosis, non-diagnostic. So normal MRI anatomy is presented in axial plane, coronal plane, and sagittal plane. So in this part of the video, we are going to identify each of the views according to their radiologic examination. So uh, in the next few slides, you may pause the video and read the texts so that you would be able to understand All right, so this is the setup of the radiograph. The chest x uh, the x-ray is here and then pointing downward. So this is the anterior posterior view. All right. So in this slide, um, what can you actually see? So figure 16 and figure 6 uh, 16.8 and 16-9 are in the following slide. So please identify the follow the following the distal humerus, the ulna, the radius, the humor ulnar and humeroradial joint spaces and the carrying angle of the elbow. So this is the lateral view. So this is taken with the elbow flexed to 90 degrees, which demonstrates the distal humerus and the proximal radius and ulna. Uh, visible structures include the olecranon process in the anterior portion of the radial head and the humeral radial joint. So I'll give you time to read on the radio radiologic um, observations and the footnotes on the figure 16-10. So this is the setup of the radiograph uh, during an x-ray of the lateral view of the elbow. So please still read on the radiologic observations. So again, what can you see? So you can identify the following in the next few slides.
So in this slide, we will be continuing on the radiologic examination of the elbow. All right, so uh, this is the oblique view. And remember that oblique views of the elbow may be obtained with the patient's arm in internal or external rotation. And the choice is determined by the specific area of interest. The elbow is in full extension for the either projection. So what I meant by specific area of interest is that it depends on whether you palpated a tumor on that side and then you can do and then uh, it can be visibly seen more on the intern uh, on internal rotation than external rotation or any other pain on that side so you can actually do that all right so i'll take you uh, give you time to uh, read on this one and then also in the next slide you can uh, once again identify the structures okay all right, so for this view, this is actually the external rotation, all right, still on the elbow, and it's in the oblique view. So as you can see, there's a, a, an external rotation of the elbow right there. All right, so the next is try to identify the structures uh, with the radiograph and the tracing. So in this case, this is the routine radiologic evaluation of the forearm. Okay, forearm is different than the elbow. And uh, there are two views in this side. You have the anterior posterior view and the lateral view. So the anterior posterior view, uh, this view demonstrates the elbow, the entire radius and the ulna and also the wrist. So um, try to read on the radiologic observations. Um, all right, and identify the radiograph or the parts in the radiograph uh, with the tracing. All right. So in the next slide, this is actually the lateral view of the forearm, and the lateral view demonstrates the elbow, the entire length of the radius and ulna, and the wrist, and seen in this uh, picture. All right. So once again, read the radiologic observations, and then also identify the parts of the radiograph in the tra uh, and the tracing. Advanced imaging evaluations using CT scans, MRI, and diagnostic ultrasounds. So chronic elbow pain may be caused by a variety of osseous or soft tissue abnormalities. Uh, radiographs will continue to be the first imaging test performed for most suspected bone and soft tissue abnormalities of the elbow and will often suffice to either, number one, diagnose problems, uh, or initiate treatments or exclude an abnormality and direct further imaging. For example, radiographs may reveal intraarticular loose bodies, osteophytes, hetero heterotrophic ossifications, or calcium deposits in and around the joints. If the etiology of chronic pain is uncertain or the patient does not improve with conservative care, advanced imaging may be considered. Uh, CT scans may be indicated to identify occult fractures, osteochondral lesions, specific uh, locations of loose bodies. MRI may reveal occult fracture abnormalities of the synovium, joint capsule, ligaments, or tendons. Diagnostic ultrasound is appropriate for examination of suspected biceps tendon tears, bursitis, or epicondylitis. As always, the result of any advanced imaging study test may be misleading if not closely correlated with the radiographs, clinical histories, and physical examination of the patient. So there's an introduction to interpreting elbow sectional anatomy. So these are using, uh, this is using your CT scans or MRI. So in this case, um, it's, more, um, it's more on three planes, the eight shell, sagittal, and coronal planes, for both CT scan and MRI. So the elbow is the most difficult joint to position for CT scan or MRI, although it is most comfortable for the patients to have their arm uh, by their side in the scanner. This would cause unnecessary radiation exposure to the thorax during CT scanning and during MRI as well. A preferred position for either exam is to have the patient positioned prone or supine with the arm overhand in a mighty mouse, so this one, one arm, or a superman wherein there is two arms position. So there is also a variation of this overhead position is to flex the elbow, referred to as the FABS position, acronymed as 
fabs. So that's flexed elbow, abducted arm, and supinated forearm. So this position will allow a, a full longitudinal look at the biceps and brachioradialis tendons on MRI imaging. All right, so with that in mind, uh, there are also practice guidelines for CT scan of the elbow. So CT examinations should be performed only for a valid medical reason uh, and with the minimum exposure that provides the, uh, the image quality necessary for adequate diagnostic information. The following are the indications or the primary indications for CT scan. Um, these are the basic CT scan protocols. So a CT scan exam of the elbow extends from the top of the distal humerus or humeral metaphysis to the proximal radial metaphysis and from the medial, sorry, from the medial to the lateral epicondyles. Along with the scanning plane I just mentioned, uh, there are also reference slices uh, and they can actually be seen on the preliminary scalp view. So most current CT scanners obtain very thin slices in the eggshell plane and this thin slices data is then reconstructed into thicker around 2 or 3 or 4 millimeters, eggshell slices to reduce the number of images that would be needed to be reviewed. Sagittal and coronal images also are reformatted from the eggshell data to complete the examination. Three-dimensional reformats are also known as 3D reconstructions may be re requested for the purpose of addressing or assessing complex fracture characteristics. Remember, Two-dimensional images of 3D reformats are of limited value, and the ability to rotate the model digitally has significance for the surgeon in planning treatment. Windowing, on the other hand, refers to the ranges of radio densities displayed in an image, uh, and both bone and soft tissue windows are evaluated. Uh, CT image interpretation of the elbow um, is composed of alignment of anatomy, bone density, cartridge, joint spaces, and soft tissues. So typically, radiologists review axial slices first, then sagittal, and then coronal. This practice originated when axial slices were all that was technically available in the first decade of CT scan imaging, and slices are scrolled through sequentially via the monitoring and mouse keyboard in all three planes. And each slice is assessed for any abnormality summarized in the ABCs. All right, so in the alignment of anatomy, deviations in the geography of the bone or the joint articulations signal, uh, signal fracture. So distal, uh, dislocations or bone destructions. On axial slices, note that the humeral ulnar and humeral radial articulations as well as the proximal radio ulnar articulations. On the sagittal slices, assess the configurations of the ulnar trochlear notch and its articulation with the trochlea. Assess the radial head and its articulation with the capitulum. For bone density, as in radiographs, cortical bone is most dense as seen actually in the cortical shells of the humerus, ulna, and radius. Cancellous bone is less dense as seen in the medula medullary cavities and assess for any bone destruction signifying disease or infection. Uh, cartilage and joint spaces, that's letter C, you assess the humeroradial and humeroulnar joint spaces for smooth chondral surfaces. Osteochondral lesions are most common at the capitulum and radial head. And in any of the arthritis, subchondral cysts or erosions can occur. Identify any free fragments that may be mi mi uh, migrated to the joint space from a fracture. And for the ass that soft tissues, the anterior soft tissue includes the biceps and the brachialis muscles and tendons, and the posterior tissues include the triceps and unconscious muscles. The lateral tissues include the common extensor tendon originating on the lateral epicondyle and the extensor supinator group of the muscles in, and the flexor group or the brachioradialis muscles. The medial soft tissues include the common flexor tendon originating on the medial epicondyle and the flexor pronator group of the muscles. So, axial slices are positioned parallel to the distal surface of the humerus, and slices above this point will contain the humerus. 
the olecranon process of the ulna and surrounding tissues. Slices below this point will contain the radius, ulna, and surrounding tissues. For, for the sagittal plane, images are similar in appearance to the lateral radiograph. The relationship of the humeral capitulum to the radial head and the humeral trochlea to the coronoid process of the ulna are seen. Coronoid or coronal plane images, on the other hand, are similar to the anterior posterior radiograph. All three articulations of the elbow joint may be seen on a coronal plane. Remember to review the geography of the elbow anatomy on radiograph first. Uh, and then the anatomical relationships do not change when the modalities change. So I think I already mentioned the three-dimensional reformats a while ago, or the 3D reconstruction. So I'll just leave this on to you. It's a T scan. Now we're going to MRI. So now we will be discussing more on the practice guidelines for magnetic resonance imaging of the elbow. And the following are actually indications for MRI of the elbow. And I'll just uh, leave you to read this one. Okay. So additionally, MRI of the shoulder may be indicated to further clarify and stage conditions diagnosed clinically and or suggest by other imaging modalities, including the following. This one here. And... Finally, MRI of the shoulder may be useful to evaluate specific clinical scenarios, including the following here. All right, so I'll leave that up to you. Let's go to the next slide. So there are certain contraindications. The possible contraindications may include cardiac pacemakers because during MRI, if there are pacemakers, they are usually made by, of metals. And, um, you know, metals would actually attract in MRI. Ferromagnetic intracranial aneurysm clips, uh, certain neurostimulators, certain cochlear implants still with metals, and certain other ferromagnetic foreign bodies, electronic devices, extensive tattoos, or non-removable body piercings. All right, so for the, uh, these are actually basic MRI protocols wherein um, MRI evaluation for the elbow requires protocols and coil selections that can accommodate both large structures such as the triceps and the bicep tendons and uh, very small structures such as the collateral ligaments. So all protocols will be a combination of anatomy, defining sequences, and fluid sensitive sequences. So there are two. So divided among these three imaging planes, so the coronal, the sagittal, and the eggshell. So remember that the fundamental tenets of Musculoskeletal MRI for any point are two folds. Number one is define the anatomy, and the next one is uh, are there or you detect any abnormal fluids. So in the arrangement below here, the sequence protocol for the shoulder, uh, the anatomy sequence is paired with the fluid sensitive sequence, and the images are presented this way on the following pages so, or slides. So a method of reading the image is to match these paired sequences or slice, uh, slice by slice, identifying the anatomy, then looking for abnormality or abnormal high or bright signals. All right. So along with that, there are also certain MR images interpretations of elbow. So still, it will follow A, B, C, Ds, the alignment of anatomy, bone signals, uh, cartilage edema and also soft tissues all right so i'll leave this up to you to read on it right and then um uh these will actually comes uh come out with a uh on the exam all right so for this one, you can actually see figures 16-32 uh, to 16-38 in your book. Or you can also just um, see it here in the slides or in the video. So uh, remember that uh, you have three planes. So these are the observations that you, mu you must uh, check. All right. So um, this is the eggshell view of the elbow. All right, and uh, these are the actual planes, and these are the structures that can be seen best. Okay, so I'll leave that up to you to read and memorize. So uh, as what I've mentioned, you have the fat saturation, 
seen in HLT2 weighted images to detect for uh, abnormal fluid. All right, so this is the sagittal plane. All right, T2 images of the sagittal plane. This is the coronal plane here. And um, we have the MR arthrogram. So the MR arthrogram is a combination of MR and arthrography, and all three imaging planes are evaluated. Distension of joint capsules via injection of dilute gadolinium allows identification of all intraarticular tissues. All right. So this is an example of a fluoroscopic guidance for contrast injection. So you see here in letter A in axial imaging, there is the uh, injection. This is the injection and then this is the needle here. All right, in letter B, this is the axial view. C is the sagittal view and D is the coronal view. The next following slides are examples and um, it would be better if you familiarize these structures. Okay, this is the sagittal view. This is the T1 weighted sagittal view. More of the elbow. Gamay na lang guys, hapit na tamo man. So, uh, trauma to the elbow is common in all age groups and the mechanism of injury is often a fall on an outstretched hand. Although, uh, athletic activities also provide occasions for direct trauma as well as repetitive microtrauma and overuse conditions seen in adolescents and young adults. Do note that children usually fare better than adults because of their greater remodeling capacity and the surgical and post-surgical rehabilitation needs are often challenging to the orthopedist and the therapist, both of whom strive to restore the functional abilities of the joint. So the diagnostic imaging evaluation for uh, elbow trauma always begins with a routine radiograph of the elbow and forearm. Most fractures, dislocations, and subluxations are adequately demonstrated on these projections. Advanced imaging is warranted if radiographs are negative, but the suspicion for fracture is high or if soft tissue abnormalities need to be evaluated. Subtle or osteochondral fractures may be diagnosed with either MRI or with CT if MRI is not available or contraindicated. In some cases of complex fractures, a 3D reformatted CT is used to further characterize the fracture configuration to assist the surgeon in preoperative planning, such as in this figure. This is a three-dimensional CT reformation of the elbow, where there is a displaced fracture of the proximal ulna, and uh, proximal radius is also shown. All right, so there are specific radiographic soft tissue signs of trauma. There are two types. There is a fat pad sign and also the abnormal supinator line. So for the positive fat pad sign, you can go back to chapter 2 on this one. We've already mentioned this before. Fat pads are allocated anteriorly and posteriorly at the fossae of the distal humerus overlying the joint capsule. Normally, the anterior fat pads of the coronoid and radial fossae, fossae are visualized on a lateral radiograph superimposed together as a thin triangular lucency, as you can see here. All right, um, it's a thin triangular lucency just anterior to the distal humerus, and the posterior fat pad lies deep in the olecranon fossa and is not normally visible on the lateral radiograph. Right. So a positive fat pad sign is produced when the effusion distends, or the edema or a swelling distends, the capsule enough to displace the fat pads from their normal position rendering them visible as radiolucent structures within the gray soft tissues as seen in this figure. Note that although the positive fat pad sign is most often associated with, with a fracture, any condition that produces enough joint effusion will also displace the fat pads. Example would be in hemophilia, inflammatory arthritis, infection, masses, or osteochondritis desiccans. 
For the abnormal supinator line, which is another radiographic soft tissue sign of trauma, is that the fat plane overlying the supinator muscle, sometimes referred to as a supinator line, is normally seen on the lateral radiograph as a thin, lucent line parallel to the anterior aspect of the proximal third of the radius approximately at least one centimeter from the anterior margin of the radius. In virtually all cases of acute radial head fracture, this line may become elevated, okay, here as seen in this image, widened or blurred. Conditions other than trauma causing this abnormal soft tissue sign uh, includes infection and inflammatory diseases. So next in line is the fractures and dislocations. So we'll be talking about the mechanisms of injury. Um, most fractures and dislocations at the elbow joint from uh, results from a fall on an outstretched hand with or without an abduction or adduction compo component or a force applied through a flexed elbow. So fractures of the radial and ulnar shafts are more often caused by direct trauma, often associated with violent blows, motor vehicular accidents, or fall from heights. So an example, this is actually a fracture of the distal humerus. I will, we'll start with this one. So um, they are actually classified into six types. You have the supracondylar, the transcondylar, intercondylar, condylar, articular, and epicondylar. We'll go to the next page. So in letter A, that's a normal humerus. Letter B is a supracondylar fracture. So supracondylar fractures are the second most common of all extremity fractures in children following fractures of the forearm. So supracondylar fractures are divided into extension and flexion types. The infrequently seen flexion type uh, injury displaces the distal fragment anterior to the humeral shaft. And the frequently seen extension type injury displaces the distal fragment posterior to the humeral shaft and is more likely to be associated with neurovascular damage in the anticubital region. So um, what I've just mentioned is seen in this figure, extension type supracondylar fracture of the distal humerus, wherein the distal humeral fragment is pos uh, seen posteriorly to the shaft. So complications include malunion, with a resultant cubitus virus or gun stock deformity, peripheral nerve injury, and Vokman's ischemia, a form of compartment syndrome due to occlusion of the brachial artery. So this is uh, in figure 16.46, this is known as Vokman's ischemia. Okay. All right. So um, we go to the next one. Uh, letter C is a transcondylar fracture. So uh, these occur more often in falls of elderly persons who are compromised by osteoporosis. So there is another picture here at 16.47. Uh, this is a transcondylar fracture of the distal humerus. As you can see, this is the fracture site. All right. So um, up next, letter D is a, an intercondylar fracture. Right? So intercondylar fractures are most common uh, distal humeral fracture in adults and results from a direct force that causes the wedge-like olecranon to be driven into the distal humeral articular surface, uh, splitting the condyles. Uh, letter E is a condylar fracture. These are actually uncommon in adults but are seen with some frequency in children. So the oblique fracture line extends through both non-articular and articular portions of the condyle and then fractures of the lateral condyle are most common, generally thought to occur as a result of virus force avulsing the condyle. Um, in letter F, we have an articular fracture, includes fractures of the capitulum and trochlea and are rare in all age groups. When present, the fracture line is usually in the coronal plane, parallel to the anterior surface of the humerus. Because the fracture fragments are largely cartilaginous, radiographs may not always reveal their true size. And lastly, we have epicondylar fractures. They are uncommon in adults and when present are usually the result of a direct blow with a prominent medial epicondyle more likely to be involved. In children and in adolescents, the medial epicondyle is more commonly injured from the avulsed or the avulsion forces sustained through the facial growth plates or in association with uh, elbow dislocations.
For the radiologic evaluations and the treatments, I'll leave this to you to read on it further. All right, so these are the complications. All right, so let's proceed to fractures of the radial head. So um, fractures of the radial head are common in adults, comprising about one-third of all the fractures above, above the elbow. And radial head fractures are divided into four types by Mason classic classification system. So there are four classifications and um, you can just read on this one and then look at the figure at 16.42. All right, so for the radiologic evaluation and the treatment, I'll leave that up to you as well. For the fractures of the proximal ulna, uh, the, these disrupt the trochlear notch, have the, uh, the potential to impair both flexion, extension mobility, and medial lateral stability at the elbow. And their electron fractures are generally classified as undisplaced, displaced, or comminuted, uh, as seen in the figure. And the fracture line may be extra articular, confined to the electron tip, or an intra articular extending to the articular surfaces. Once again, I'll leave you the radiologic evaluation and the treatment. For figure 16.51, it's in the next slide. This one. All right, so let's continue to fractures of the forearm. So fractures of the forearm, both uh, the radial and the ulnar shafts are usually displaced fractures and due to severity of force necessary to injure both bones. All right, so fractures um, of the radial shaft alone usually occurs in the distal third of the shaft. The proximal third is rarely fractured due to the protection of the surrounding muscles. Fractures in the distal third of the radial shaft are often associated with subluxation or dislocation of the distal radioulnar joint. This fracture dislocation pattern is known as the Galliesis fracture. So this one here, this is known as the Galliesis fracture. All right, so the injury sustained at the distal radioulnar joint injury may be purely ligamentous tearing or may be avulsion of the ligament at the ulnar styloid in children. Fractures of the distal third radial shaft are the most common of all fractures in the body. The relative weakness of the metaphyseal region that has not yet re remodeled is probably accountable for the susceptibility of this area to fracture. Fractures of the ulnar shaft alone are fairly common. The mechanism of injury is most often a direct blow to the defensive maneuver, earning this fracture the name nightstick fracture. So this is seen in this figure, 16.54. And a common fracture dislocation involving the ulnar shaft is known as the eponym Montegas fracture. So this one. All right, so this eponym refers to the fracture of the proximal third of the ulna combined with dislocations of the radial head. Sorry. For the radiologic evaluation of uh, for the forearm, the imaging evaluation of forearm fractures begin with routine radiographs of both the elbow and the forearm, including the wrist. So usually you have multiple um, joints. In this case, you have the elbow and the wrist joint. The additional projections are necessary because the anatomic relations of the radius and the ulna form a ring-like configuration, and the fracture at one site may disrupt an adjacent articulation. Also, associated fractures may simultaneously occur at the wrist or distal humerus. For the treatment, fractures of both the radius and the ulnar shafts often require open reduction and internal fixation, or ORIF, to correct angular and rotational deformities in order to regain normal supination and pronation mobility. Most fractures of the radial shaft alone are treated non-operatively with cast immobilization more or less uh, around 3 to 6 months. Undisplaced fractures occurring proximal to the level of ins insertion of the pronator teres are treated by immobil immobilization with the forearm in nearly full supination to prevent the unopposed pole of the supinator brevis and biceps brachii from subsequently displacing the proximal fracture fragment. Fractures occurring distal to the insertion of the pronator teres do not require immobilization in this manner because the pronator teres balances the pole of the supinator is very important to analyze. Fracture dislocations usually require over or operative treatment 
to restore supination, prenation mobility, and avoid post-traumatic arthritis at the distal radio-ulnar joint. Ulnar shaft fractures are treated with immobilization if undisplaced, but displaced fractures generally require open reduction and internal fixation, again or if. For the complications of the forearm fractures, the common complication includes the distal radio ulnar dysfunction, loss of motion, and arthritic changes at the wrist. Uh, mild union can be caused by improper positioning in the cast or failure to perform cast changes as needed. Montegas fracture, as I just mentioned here in this figure, um, may be comprised by re radial head instability and non-union. Damage to the radial and median nerves is associated with this injury. In children, the incidence of radial shaft refracture is as high as 12% and a refracture may occur up to one year after injury. Precautions are advised against return to active sports for at least one month after cast removal. Overgrowth is not uncommon for the 6 to 8 month period after injury. And the average amount is 6 to 7 millimeters and is considered functionally insignificant. Alright, so let's continue with dislocations of the elbow. So, uh, elbow dislocations are most often due to fall and an outstretched hand uh, that levers the olecranon away from the trochlea. Dislocations of the elbow joint are described by directions uh, that the radius and the ulna have displaced in relation to the distal humerus. So, which is here found in figure 16-56. So there are, there are three types of elbow dislocations. Um, it can involve only the radius, only the ulna, and both the radius and the ulna. Alright, so I'll leave the imaging evaluation and treatment of this one. And then uh, lastly, we have the abnormal conditions at the elbow. So we have only two types here. We have epicondylitis and the other one is osteochondritis desiccans. So I'll be explaining both. Um, epicondylitis uh, has two types because you have two epicondyles, one on the medial and one on the lateral side. So these are actually their eponyms, as you can see. So familiarize them, and I think you already know them. So epicondylitis is defined as overuse injuries characterized in the acute stage of tendinitis. More or less, it's painful, there is swelling, and sometimes there is decreased range of motion. Tendinosis, which is a term for chronic cases, develops due to repetitive stress, which prevents the tendon from healing normally. I'll leave the imaging evaluations and treatment to you. Alright, so this is the last one, which is known as the osteochondritis desiccans. So, uh, this is a localized uh, joint injury that involves a separation of the segment of the cartilage and subcondyle bone from the articular surface. This is... This is an example, here and here. All right, so over 75% of the cases occur at the knee, but the elbow, ankle, and wrist are also susceptible. In the elbow joint, the most common site of OCD or osteochondritis desiccans is in the anterolateral aspect of the capitulum. It is theorized that repeated valgus stress, a tenuous blood supply within the capitulum, and disparity in the mechanical properties of the radial head and lateral capitulum factor into the lo localization of OCD at the capitulum. OCD typically presents in the young adolescent athlete with open growth plates. So repetitive microtrauma activities such as throwing create valgus compressive forces in the radiocapitular joint. A similar mechanism is noted in the upper extremity weight-bearing skills of gymnasts and the pain is usually dull, poorly localized, aggravated with use, and improved with rest. So you can actually add up also icing if it's within 24 hours. Alright, so I'll once again leave the imaging evaluation and also the treatment to you for you to read. Alright, so we're actually done with our uh, chapter 16, that's radiologic evaluation of the elbow. Just a brief summary of the key points. You have to know the routine radiologic evaluations, the advanced imagings, the trauma radi radiology, uh, fractures at the elbow, dislocations at the elbow, epicondylitis, and the osteochondritis desiccans at the capitulum. So for the exam, this will be a 30 to 40 item questions. All right, and then 
uh, they will most likely be definitions of what I just mentioned in this chapter. Um, there would be expect pictures, uh, but most probably um, more on identifying what those parts are, especially in the elbow, and also the um, the different types of uh, trauma fracture or uh, trauma. All right. I just mentioned a while ago the two types, the fat pad and the other one. All right, so I think that's it for the this chapter. I'll see you in the next one.